Good afternoon, or good morning, or good evening, depending on where you're watching this. It is noon on the East Coast. It is 9 a.m. on the West Coast. I'm Jeff Timmer, and joining me today is Lincoln Project Senior Advisor and President of Viking Strategies, Trigvi Olson. Trigvi, welcome. It's great to see you, as always. Thanks, Jeff. I'm, I'm becoming a regular. I was hosting on Friday and now I'm guesting on Monday. So yeah. people, I don't know, they might be losing their sandwiches. Too much trivia <laughs> time. I can never get too much trivia, that's for sure. Um, I don't know my kids <laughs> about that. Well, I thought we'd start, uh, you know, uh, you know Mitch McConnell in McConnell world as good as anybody uh, in Republican politics or, you know, former Republican politics. Uh, the, the news over the weekend that McConnell is actively whipping uh, the Republican conference to vote against uh, Biden's uh, Supreme Court pick, uh, uh, Judge Jackson. Um, what do you see is the end game here? What's the, the strategy? Why does he care at this point? Well, I mean, I think they, they've laid out the strategy where they're going. I mean, they have this belief that if, um, if you can have a, a Trump coalition, and you talk about, um, they believe that's a permanent governing coalition. Now, the problem is there is no coalition without the insanity, right? Um, she's somebody who's passed with bipartisan support, previous confirmations for other judicial nominations. Um, but, you know, I think this is this is classic attempt to try and manage um, the the problem that is Trump and Trumpism in the Republican Party by constantly trying to give them something and what they fail to realize is that insanity is about constantly taking and it's never enough no matter how much you give so that's kind of where i think the the if that makes yeah, well, sense yeah, yeah it, it does you know and it seems it seems counterintuitive though to the 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 notion that in competitive senate races uh, trying to increase even slightly the uh, number of black voters who will vote for Republicans or uh, not, I guess, have animosity or, or, or heightened motivation to vote against Republicans. And, as, and then also, you know, the, the college-educated whites, uh, especially college-educated white women who have been eroding from uh, the Republican coalition over the last couple of elections. It seems kind of counterintuitive in that effort to attract them back or to, to kind of stave the, the, uh, the um, uh, defection of those kinds of voters. And so, you know, the, 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 the hyper intensity on the base, those, those hardcore MAGAs, it seems like the, uh, you know, the, the that McConnell has bought into the the Trump strategy from 2020, that doubling down, tripling down, quadrupling down on the insanity when it comes to the messaging and motivating the, the uh, even though they're at a, a mathematical disadvantage uh, in in many states, it seems like that's that's what they're counting on is to get them to punch above their weight by. Uh, making the court uh, in this third seat uh, on, on the court an, an issue. Yeah, I mean, I think it's all about turnout, right? Like at some point, um, there's the, the 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 idea that, and it might not, it might be some political strategy in a in an off year election, but a base strategy. We're going to try and amp up the base any way we can and around anything we can. And so um, that's why, you know, from a Lincoln Project perspective, and you're, you're intimately involved in this as well, um, it's all about the Bannon line, and, and to some degree it's about the Putin line of Republicans. There has to be a cost for them pursuing a strategy 
um, that's about dividing the pieces of the Republican Party that do think um, it's not genius what Putin's doing, it's genocide. So they disagree with the Trump people that, um, you know, what went on in that Supreme Court nomination um, was, uh, you know, just not normal um, along the Bannon line. So when, when they pursue that strategy, um, the key thing is how do you take and, and whittle away the other side of that? I mean, the thing that has to be remembered about the Republican party is it is really divided into two camps. The, you know, now is yeah, absolutely. Is the traditional wing of terrified of that mega wing? Yeah, absolutely. Um, but the key thing is to use these sort of, um, to use these kinds of issues, whether it's what they've said about Putin taking Russia's side or it's, you know, Supreme Court justice nominees, it's about wedging those people off um, either one way or the other, right? I mean, McConnell's making a bet that if he just lets people vote their conscience on this, there's going to be Republicans who vote for her to be on the Supreme Court. Um, and that that's going to be bad because then mega people won't turn out. Um, the key thing is to create a consequence the other way that reasonable, rational people um, look at this and say, enough is enough. Yeah, and that seems to be some place that the Biden White House and the Democrats are falling down. There doesn't seem to be a drumbeat about uh, their, their, uh, trying to uh, establish any consequence to voting against uh, Judge Jackson. There, uh, you know, there hasn't been, as far as I'm aware, anything going on in, say, uh, Wisconsin aimed at Ron Johnson. Not that he's going to ever vote for Jackson, but trying to raise the stakes ahead of his uh, reelection campaign this fall uh, in, uh, you know, in the Milwaukee and in some markets there that will be so key in in those states and you know you and i have talked uh, often about how the 2022 elections the, the path uh in the the import of the 2022 elections will have ultimately on the 2024 elections runs through wisconsin pennsylvania and michigan and the governor's races particularly in those but two of those states have big huge Senate races that are going to be very important to control of that chamber with Johnson running for re-election in Wisconsin and the open seat in, in uh, Pennsylvania. And neither uh, uh, Pennsylvania or Wisconsin have a particularly large uh, African-American voting contingent, but it's significant enough uh, that it would seem uh, th that, uh, you know, the, a Republican candidate looking to build the coalition rather than just try to uh, figure out how to make the most of the limited coalition they have uh, would be a smarter uh, electoral bet. Uh, but they don't, they, they've chosen a, a, a different path. Well, and quite honestly, if you know either of them, um, you know, Pennsylvania pretty well, because to, to a large degree, the states politically operate in a lot of the same ways. Um, so, you know, if you use Wisconsin as an example, uh, kind of to your point, Ron Johnson's up for re-election. Um, you have Milwaukee County, which has the highest percentage of African-Americans of any county in Wisconsin. And if you're a Democrat running against Ron Johnson, the way you win is you run up your margins and your turnout in Milwaukee and Dane County, which is University of Wisconsin and state government, which is sort of like Detroit and Lansing in, in Michigan. Um, and then and then if you do that, you balance out um, the places where Republicans are strong in the in the bigger cities. And then it then it comes down to both the turnout levels in and kind of the swing places that are out state. Um, and so, you know, if you're a Democrat running and you don't get that turnout in Milwaukee, you're going to lose before you ever get to 
to the places where the race is going to be won and lost. Same in Michigan. Same in Philly with Philly and Pennsylvania. Um, you're right. In a normal sort of environment back, you know, 20 years ago when you and I were coming up in politics 30 years ago, when you had people like John Engler or Tommy Thompson or Tom Ridge, you know, the play was, I mean, when I was working around Governor Thompson world and we were talking about reforming welfare, the first people we went and talked to were African American legislators in, in Milwaukee County to see where were places that we could work together. I know Engler was doing similar and so were Ridge. That isn't the way it is now though. Your base. It's also why, you know, you're never going to see um, Republican candidates running today in those states getting the kinds of margins that Engler, Ridge, and Thompson did. You know, Tommy got 70% in one of those elections because and he, I think he won Milwaukee County. So, but that isn't what they're trying to do. The bet they're making is that the easier play is is not faith in each other. I talk about this all the time, but about creating fear of one another. And that, that's kind of where the rubber meets the road as it relates to, you know, what's going on with Putin. That is really the, 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 the battle, you know, people talk about democracy versus autocracy or whatever. At the end of the day, it's we're going to be a world where we're all afraid of each other and trying to use fear to impose our will, or are we going to be one where we have faith in one another? um and build together and you know joe biden's done a great job internationally of doing that um it will be interesting to see if more democrats try and and and, and do create some opportunities to reach across the band and line reach out to some of the republicans i mean that's that they should be um but they have their own base to fear too sure you, you, you mentioned the, yeah you, you, you mentioned the, the, the Putin line as it uh, uh, relates to the Republicans as well. And the uh, Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin also share a high degree of uh, European ethnic voter, or now probably second, third generation um, folks that came over uh, from Europe uh, early in the, the 20th century and then more after World War II. But how much do you think that there's still any of that uh, uh, consideration of, of ethnic politics and the the way that the Republicans react to Putin in the war in Russia or in Ukraine? Is that going to have any uh, ability for the Dems to create a wedge with some of those white uh, voters in those states. Some of those voters, uh, sorry, cut out for a second. Um, yeah, I mean, I think I think ground zero for that is going to be Ohio. And it's going to be Ohio because you have, uh, and Pennsylvania to a degree, um, in large part because you have such large populations. First generation in, in Ohio, you know, there's 80,000 of them just in the general Cincinnati area, which, as you know, you know, Cincinnati is is sort of Republican. That's that's the place in Ohio where Republicans need to run up their numbers. Um, and I would suspect that up until this point, up until Trump, most of those voters voted Republican. Um, I think it also gets missed that, you know, that that's kind of during the Cold War, those were key constituencies. Ronald Reagan's first stop after announcing in 1980 was at a Lithuanian Polish community center in, in Illinois, uh, which was the swing state at the time. Um, Pennsylvania has the largest percentage of, of um, Ukrainian Americans in the United States. But it isn't just Ukrainian Americans. I mean, there's a lot of first generation Americans from the Baltic states, Czech Republic and other places. Um, now, you know, one of the key things is going to be reaching out to them so that they understand the stakes. Um, but I think they intuitively, when they're seeing images, do. <coughs> yeah, well, you, you mentioned uh, when we opened the show that you've become a, a regular on here and you've talked about this before, but why don't you just give the uh, the 10,000-foot the view of your experience in democracy 
projects and the work you've done in Eastern Europe uh, that doesn't relate directly to uh, American um, uh, partisan elections, but relates uh, to the pro-democracy effort worldwide. Right. So, you know, my, as you know, my career has really been two paths that for a long time operated independently of one another. in Republican politics up until 2016. Um, obviously, you mentioned did work for McConnell World. Um, but the other side of my career for over 30 years, starting in 2000, or starting in 1995, um, I was asked by an organization run by Senator McCain to go to Poland for three weeks. And Tommy Thompson World said, you should go do this, um, to basically mobilize young Poles to get out and vote after the fall of the Soviet Union. Um, that led to having experience getting, it was, a, we did basically an MTV rock the boat for those of you on watching who are old enough to remember MTV doing rock the boat. Um, and so I traveled around with the Rolling Stones of Poland. Um, and that, that ended up being the first time that USAD and had, had tried doing something like that. So I was constantly getting asked after that because I was the one guy who had experience in how do you get young people to go out and vote, to do work in all these other places. And eventually that led to doing work in Serbia, where I where I worked with some guys, Gene Sharp and Bob Halvey, who are the global experts on nonviolent resistance, um, like, you know, Gandhi kind of nonviolent resistance. So I learned how to both mobilize young people and then how what kinds of tactics could be used against autocrats. And so at that point I was getting asked to go and work and train, you know, Russians, Ukrainians, Georgians, Burmese, Venezuelans, you name it, um, on how to work um, with autocrats. So I've trained, you know, probably tens of thousands of activists worldwide, 40 countries, five continents, um, autocrats. Um, if you were to think of an autocrat or, or, or who's in charge, I've likely worked with those struggling for democracy against them. You know, in 2016, it struck me that those two roads were starting to collide. Um, obviously, when I watched what happened on 1-6, I thought, you know, the moment has arrived where the two pieces are inevitably linked even before that, as you know, when I was out in Park City helping. Um, so that really is the point of emphasis from my experiences that's probably more relevant. Um, when I think about Ukraine, you know, I did work in Ukraine in the early 2000s, 2002, 2003. Um, you know, this fight's been going on. And I, I would say to my friends, my best friends in the world are, um, are people in Western um, and I was fortunate enough to get to go out and see a lot of parts of the world. Some of them stayed closer to home. And when we go out and drink beers, I would say to them, one of the things that they needed to understand is that there were some really bad people in the world. And I would talk about some of the Russian forces that I had encountered. Um, and it's hard. People are seeing it now, <laughs> literally the images of it. But there are some incredibly brutal people. And most Americans are lucky because they never end up having to encounter the kinds of people that are committing the atrocities. But they are out there, and it's been obvious they've been doing similar things in other places. Um, and um, that's we're in a fight with them too. I mean, the ends justify any means; they're completely zero sum. And the truth of the matter is, you know, they would be doing to do it um and and so you know people like president biden those who are charged with having to deal with this regardless of party um they have some really hard choices that they have to make um because they they understand that at the same time we can't be afraid of them because that's what they're counting We've talked, and there's been so much uh, focus on 
Putin's efforts and Russia's efforts uh, since 2016 to destabilize uh, the West, to destabilize NATO, to destabilize U.S. politics. Um, certainly his uh, appetite for um, aggression in Ukraine is driven by his own uh, internal desires, uh, the, the reestablishing the Soviet or Russian Empire, whatever you want to, to look at the, his, the internal forces, the internal uh, evils that, that guide uh, Putin. But, you know, we were talking uh, ahead of the show that the, the, it also fits in, the aggression in Ukraine also fits into his long-term strategy, the long game to destabilize the United States even further. Uh, the the predictions uh, last summer uh, during Biden's first summer in the White House uh, were that this summer we'd be seeing the U.S. economy growing at seven, eight. Some rosy forecasters were even saying, you know, double digits were possible. Uh, that uh, no one was was seeing uh, inflation, uh, this, this this sharp rise in gas prices, and this destabilizing of the. Um, of the Western economy of, you know, just when you look at the reaction to gas prices, how, how many people, especially my Republican friends on Facebook would, you know, they're all for liberty and freedom until gas hits $4 a gallon. And then they're like, fuck that shit. They don't care. Um, you know, it, it, this, this, the, there's the, I don't know if it's intentional, but it, it, the, the consequences fallout from the war in Ukraine is is going to have a dampening effect on the U.S. economy, uh, on gas prices, on Biden's uh, job approval as we go into this 2022 election. And so it fits into that long-term strategy in ways that haven't been talked about that, uh, you know, we're, the, the, the way that the um, the attack on Ukraine is analyzed is from the Russian perspective and what they're looking to gain, but it also has the perhaps unintended consequence of continuing to further destabilize U.S. politics, weaken Biden, who's the only president, uh, you know, in the last uh, five years who's shown any strength against Putin. So I think, I think... My personal take on what's happening and, and, and Putin's re reasoning for going into Ukraine, um, there's a lot of noise and there's a lot of people pushing out narratives about why that is. My personal take is if you're looking and having watched it closely from, you know, nearby for a lot of years, um, I think you have to understand the bigger arc. So. You know, it isn't really about NATO. Um, it's maybe more about the European Union, but really at the end of the day, what it's about is Vladimir Putin. Vladimir Putin understands that if he gives up power, he will have to be accountable for his pillaging of Russia um, and, and his actions, which it's the end of him. Well, unless you've seen the arc, and I'm lucky that I've gotten to see the arc of Ukraine's transition. Um, if you look at, you know, from the fall of the Berlin Wall forward, all uh, the countries across Europe, as they came to grips with, you know, the former Soviet space, came to grips with what happened during World War II. Any of you who are watching who've never read Timothy Snyder's book, Bloodlands, you should, you should read it. it it's incredibly insightful. Uh, but the, that transition to uh, normal democratic parts of Europe happened at different paces. And there were two tracks going on. There was the economic track of integration into the European Union. So we're going to have rule of law. We're going to have commerce, free trade. We're going to not have crony capital side of it which is nato right and the two go hand in hand if you think about the united states as the most prosperous country in the world that that starts with our political stability in part because we've had two oceans um and so so you had the two pieces going hand in hand you had some places like czech republic or slovakia or poland or the baltic states where it happened pretty fast 
right? They were they just for a lot of reasons. You had other places like Belarus, Ukraine, as you go further east, um, Russia, where it happened, it didn't happen, or it was happening really slowly in fits and starts. Certainly Belarus and Russia fell back pretty fast. But Ukraine was unique because Ukraine had their ebbs and flows, but Ukraine was really starting to get both the economic rule of law and it and as they were becoming your more european and it was moving west to east in ukraine um ukrainians were becoming an alternative model for belarus and russia and if you fast forward to 2020 you know this isn't talked about enough um but you had elections in belarus Alexander Lukashenko is Europe's last dictator, was referred to as Europe's last dictator. He's been there since 94, 95. Um, rules with an iron fist. Hundreds of thousands of people came to the streets. In fact, Lukashenko lost control and Putin had to step in and save him and basically de facto occupy the country. Ukraine was central to that because it was a place that Belarusians who wanted democracy were aspiring to. Same with the Baltic states. Um, Baltic states are in NATO, Ukraine isn't. And so if you're Putin, you've watched that, you've seen Lukashenko teeter, you're worried about that himself. I mean, what, what Vladimir Putin, when he closes his eyes, what he's most afraid of is either a palace coup or probably more so millions of people on the streets in Moscow coming to get him. Ukraine was starting to become a alternative model that Russians could relate to. And so all of this talk about denazification and hate and whatever, it's, it really, for him, he may believe those things, but in reality, what it's about, he is wanting to crush and punish Ukrainians for basically wanting to become European, small D Democrat, stable, prosperous country um that's outside his and, and thereby becoming a threat to his rule because ultimately that's that in the united states you know is is if ukraine is a small shining city on a hill and the baltic states are the united states sits there for vladimir putin as the big shining city on a hill and at some point they made a conscientious decision you know probably before two well clearly just before 2016 that they were gonna go all in on undermining that because he understands the threat of that. Remember, he was sitting in Dresden when Reagan's shining city on a hill became the alternative that led people to the streets. So I know that's a little bit longer history probably than what you were looking for, but, but that's really where it rests. And that's where it meets the road back here. And Donald Trump is the, is the perfect, and, and the extremism that Trumpism and Fox News that they prevail, um, that is that is really serving his ends. Now, how much of that is just, you know, them lighting matches? Uh, Flynn in Moscow sitting at a table with, with Vladimir Putin. Um, he doesn't care. He's agnostic. It's just that the right is easier for him to use. Sure, that makes sense. Well, you know, with, over the weekend, we also saw uh, pro-Putin candidates get reelected uh, in um, Hungary and in Serbia. Uh, France has a big election coming up. What what should we be watching for uh, in the the French elections? Is you know we're, we're focused on the the Russian efforts to undermine U.S. elections. Are they engaged in the same kind of efforts in other European countries like France? Um, yeah, I mean, they've been interfering across, um, this has been going on in Europe even before it was going on in the U S and, you know, the amount of money that's gone to the Marie Le Pen's and the far right and the far left, that's what they do. I mean, they basically see money. Yeah. Conspiracy theories, they seed. And, and you've seen, I, I do the, a presentation, people can go on Twitter and you can see this um, a video that I've put together that talks about how Lesnea and Fermencia works. And 
Lisney information is false information with purpose. They put money behind it, but basically you try and plant as many seeds as possible um, to sow distress. And then it works its way through the system to create radicalization and violence. And that's what, what we ultimately saw on on one six was people who had reached the stages of overconfidence in their opinions and the intolerance of the other side being pushed through need narrative and network to take radicalized violent actions. That's, you know, no different than what we saw in 9-11. It's no different than what you're seeing in Ukraine. Well, unfortunately, that's all the time we have. I could continue this discussion for, for another half hour. Uh, Trig V. Olson, Senior Advisor to the Lincoln Project, President of Viking Strategies. Thank you for joining us today on Lunch with Lincoln. Uh, tune in on Friday for another Lunch with Lincoln at noon and tune in on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday at 7.30 for other Lincoln Project TV streaming. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff, for having me on. Drive safe.